First part of chapter 10 of the first volume of The Life of Reason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Fredrik Karlsson. The Life of Reason by George Santayana. Chapter 10. The Measure of Values in Reflection. Side note. Honesty in Hedonism. To put value in pleasure and pain, regarding a given quantity of pain as balancing a given quantity of pleasure, is to bring to practical ethics a worthy intention to be clear and, what is more precious, an undoubted honesty not always found in those moralists who maintain the opposite opinion and care more for edification than for truth. For in spite of all logical and psychological scruples, conduct that should not justify itself somehow by the satisfaction secured and the pains avoided would not justify itself at all. The most instinctive and unavoidable desire is forthwith chilled if you discover that its ultimate end is to be a preponderance of suffering, and what arrests this desire is not fear or weakness, but conscience in its most categorical and sacred guise. Who would not be ashamed to acknowledge or to propose so inhuman an action? By sad experience, rooted impulses may be transformed or even obliterated, and quite intelligibly, for the idea of pain is already the sign and the beginning of a certain stoppage. To imagine failure is to interpret ideally a felt inhibition. To prophecy a check would be impossible but for an incipient movement already meeting an incipient arrest. Intensified, this prophecy becomes its own fulfillment and totally inhibits the opposed tendency. Therefore a mind that foresees pain to be the ultimate result of action cannot continue unreservedly to act, seeing that its foresight is the conscious transcript of a recoil already occurring. Conversely, the mind that surrenders itself wholly to any impulse must think that its execution would be delightful. A perfectly wise and representative will, therefore, would aim only at what in its attainment could continue to be aimed at and approved, and this is another way of saying that its aim would secure the maximum of satisfaction eventually possible. Side note, necessary qualifications. In spite, however, of this involution of pain and pleasure in all deliberate forecast and volition, pain and pleasure are not the ultimate sources of value. A correct psychology and logic cannot allow that an eventual and, in strictness, unpresentable feeling can determine any act or volition, but must insist that, on the contrary, all beliefs about future experience with all premonition of its emotional quality is based on actual impulse and feeling so that the source of value is nothing but the inner fountain of life and imagination and the object of pursuit nothing but the ideal object counterpart of the present demand abstract satisfaction is not pursued but if the will and the environment are constant satisfaction will necessarily be felt in achieving the object desired a rejection of hedonistic psychology therefore by no means involves any opposition to evdaimonism in ethics evdaimonism is another name for wisdom there is no other moral morality any system that, for some sinister reason, should absolve itself from goodwill toward all creatures and make it somehow a duty to secure their misery, would be clearly disloyal to reason, humanity and justice. Nor would it be hard in that case to point out what superstition, what fantastic obsession or what private fury had made those persons blind to prudence and kindness in so plain a matter. 
happiness is the only sanction of life where happiness fails existence remains a mad and lamentable experiment the question however what happiness shall consist in its complexion if it should once arise can only be determined by reference to natural demands and capacities so that while satisfaction by the attainment of ends can alone justify their pursuit this pursuit itself must exist first and be spontaneous thereby fixing the goals of endeavour and distinguishing the states in which satisfaction might be found natural disposition therefore is the principle of preference and makes morality and happiness possible Side note, the will must judge the standard of value like every standard must be one pleasures and pains are not only infinitely diverse but even if reduced to their total bulk and abstract opposition they remain two their values must be compared and obviously neither one can be the standard by which to judge the other this standard is an ideal involved in the judgment past whatever that judgment may be thus when petrarch says that a thousand pleasures are not worth one pain he establishes an ideal of value deeper than either pleasure or pain an ideal which makes a life of satisfaction marred by a single pang an offence and a horror to his soul if our demand for rationality is less acute and the miscellaneous affirmations of the will carry us along with a well-fed indifference to some single tragedy within us we may aver that a single pang is only the thousandth part of a thousand pleasures and that a life so balanced is nine hundred and ninety-nine times better than nothing this judgment for all its air of mathematical calculation in truth expresses a choice as irrational as petrarch's it merely means that as a matter of fact the mixed prospect presented to us attracts our wills and attracts them vehemently so that the only possible criterion for the relative values of pains and pleasures is the will that chooses among them or among combinations of them nor can the intensity of pleasures and pains apart from the physical violence of their expression be judged by any other standard than by the power they have when represented to control the will's movement side note injustice inherent in representation here we come upon one of those initial irrationalities in the world theories of all sorts since they are attempts to find rationality in things are in serious danger of overlooking in estimating the value of any experience our endeavour our pretension is to weigh the value which that experience possesses when it is actual but to weigh is to compare and to compare is to represent since the transcendental isolation and self-sufficiency of actual experience precludes its lying side by side with another datum like two objects given in a single consciousness successive values to be compared must be represented but the conditions of representation are such that they rob objects of the values they had at their first appearance to substitute the values they possess at their recurrence for representation mirrors consciousness only by mirroring its objects and the emotional reaction upon those objects cannot be represented directly but is approached by indirect methods through an imitation or assimilation of will to will and emotion to emotion only by the instrumentality of science like gesture or language can we bring ourselves to reproduce in some measure an absent experience and to feel some premonition of its absolute value 
Apart from very elaborate and cumulative suggestions to the contrary, we should always attribute to an event in every other experience the value which its image now had in our own. But in that case the pathetic fallacy would be present. For a volitional reaction upon an idea in one vital context is no index to what the volitional reaction would be in another vital context upon the situation which that idea represents. Side note. Aesthetic and speculative cruelty. This divergence falsifies all representation of life and renders it initially cruel, sentimental, and mythical. We dislike to trample on a flower because its form makes a kind of blossoming in our own fancy which we call beauty. But we laugh at pangs we endured in childhood and feel no tremor at the the incalculable sufferings of all mankind beyond our horizon because no imitable image is involved to start a contrite thrill in our own bosom the same cruelty appears in aesthetic pleasures in lust war and ambition in the illusions of desire and memory in the unsympathetic quality of theory everywhere which regards the uniformities of cause and effect and the beauties of law as a justification for the inherent evils in the experience described in the unjust judgments finally of mystical optimism that sinks so completely into its subjective commotion as to mistake the suspension of all discriminating and representative faculties for a true union in things and the blur of its own ecstasy for a universal glory these pleasures are all on the sensuous plane the plane of levity and unintentional wickedness but in their own sphere they have their own value. Aesthetic and speculative emotions make an important contribution to the total worth of existence, but they do not abolish the evils of that experience on which they reflect with such ruthless satisfaction. The satisfaction is due to a private flood of emotions submerging the images present in fancy or to the exercise of a new intellectual function, like that of abstraction, synthesis, or comparison. Such a faculty, when fully developed, is capable of yielding pleasures as intense and voluminous as those proper to rudimentary animal functions, wrongly supposed to be more vital. The acme of vitality lies in truth in the most comprehensive and penetrating thought. The rhythms, the sweep, the impetuosity of impassioned contemplation not only contain in themselves a great vitality and potency, but they often succeed in engaging the lower function in a sympathetic vibration, and we see the whole body and soul wrapped, as we say, and borne along by the harmonies of imagination and thought. In these fugitive moments of intoxication, the detail of truth is submerged and forgotten. The emotions which would be suggested by the parts are replaced by the rapid emotion of transition between them, and this acceleration in survey, this mountaintop experience, is supposed to be also the truest vision of reality. Absorption in a supervening function is mistaken for comprehension of all fact, and this inevitably, since all consciousness of particular facts and of their values is then submerged in the torrent of cerebral excitement. Side note, imputed values, their inconstancy. That luminous blindness which in these cases takes on extreme form is present in principle throughout all reflection. We tend to regard our own past as good only when we still find some value in the memory of it. Last year, 
last week even the feelings of the last five minutes are not otherwise prized than by the pleasure we may still have in recalling them the pulsations of pleasure or pain which they contained we do not even seek to remember or to discriminate the period is called happy or unhappy merely as its ideal representation exercises fascination or repulsion over the present will hence the revulsion after physical indulgence often most violent when the pleasure judged by its concomitant expression and by the desire that heralded it was most intense for the strongest passions are intermittent so that the unspeakable charm which their objects possess for a moment is lost immediately and becomes unintelligible to a chilled and cheated reflection the situation when yet unrealized irresistibly solicited the will and seemed to promise incomparable ecstasy and perhaps it yields an indescribable moment of excitement and triumph a moment only half appropriated into a waking experience so fleeting is it and so unfit the mind to possess or retain its tenser attitudes the same situation if revived in memory when the system is in an opposite and relaxed state for fates all power to attract and fills the mind rather with aversion and disgust for all violent pleasures as shakespeare says are cruel and not to be trusted a bliss and proof and proved a very woe before a joy proposed behind a dream enjoyed no sooner but despised straight past reason hunted and no sooner had past reason hated side note methods of control past reason indeed for although an impulsive injustice is inherent in the very nature of representation and cannot be overcome altogether yet reason by attending to all the evidences that can be gathered and by confronting the first pronouncement by others fetched from every quarter of experience has power to minimize the error and reach a practically just estimate of absent values this achieved rightness can be tested by comparing two experiences each when it is present with the same conventional permanent object chosen to be their expression a love song for instance can be pronounced adequate or false by various lovers and it can thus remain a sort of index to the fleeting sentiments once confronted with it reason has to be sure no independent method of discovering values they must be rated as the sensitive balance of present inclination when completely laden shows them to stand in estimating values reason is reduced to data furnished by the mechanical processes of ideation and instinct as in framing all knowledge an absent joy can only be represented by a tinge of emotion dying an image that pictures the situation in which the joy was felt but the suggested value being once projected into the potential world that land of inferred being this projection may be controlled and corroborated by other suggestions and associations relevant to it which it is the function of reason to collect and compare a right estimate of absent values must be conventional and mediated by signs direct sympathies which suffice for instinctive present cooperation fail to transmit alien or opposite pleasures they overemphasize momentary relations while they necessarily ignore permanent bonds therefore the same intellect that puts a mechanical reality behind perception must put a moral reality behind sympathy. End of chapter ten, part one.